So without further ado, let's welcome Dad O, Bonatow, tech entrepreneur, investor, philanthropist, and Rajiv Ayangar, CEO of Cryptagon. Can you hear this? It's way too much volume. Great, so uh, I'm Rajiv, um, and I'll be moderating this discussion. And so just a quick overview, I'll give a brief intro on Dado, and then we'll get straight into a dialogue. Um, sorry, yeah, we'll get, so we'll get straight into a dialogue and uh, talk about some interesting themes, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. So, a bit about myself, I uh, founder of Cryptagon, more on that in the blockchain session at one. Most importantly, I was a Banatan scholar. So that has been uh, since, since college. So really just brief highlights on Dada. Born in Cagayan, was a Boeing engineer uh, and pilot. Uh, did his master's at Stanford, founded three companies, VC at Tallwood Ventures, and then now he's tackling poverty in the Philippines with PhilDev. And I was thinking about how to contextualize the contributions. And I think the best way to understand what Dada has done is to think about three big waves of computing. So on top, we've got the wave of personal computing, like going from mainframes to phones. And then we have the progression of graphics. And then most recently, uh, an offshoot of the GPUs we've got deep learning. So Donna created the PC chipset. Right? This led to the smartphones that we all have. He also created the graphics accelerator, which led to the explosion of gaming graphics that many of us enjoy. Uh, and then, most recently, he's still shaping the landscape of technology with one of his companies, Wave Computing, working on the data flow architecture. So I was thinking about why does Dado's path as an entrepreneur resonate with me so strongly and many and many others? Um, and yes, he's Filipino. Yes, uh, there's a parallel between the entrepreneur's journey and the immigrant's journey. But I think most importantly, um, he solves problems that are important with a rigor and a focus that I think creates lasting change. And I think nowadays, a lot of entrepreneurs, and I include myself in this, take a little bit more of a scattershot approach. Uh, and that can work, but I think Dada's approach is really inspiring. Um, and so with that, with that context set, um, I want to get into a dialogue. I've got some questions, so pardon me as I refer to my phone. But as you have questions throughout this, we're going to leave a fair bit of time for questions at the end. Here's the link, bit.ly ask Dada. Um, and then, so please ask away. So where I want to start, we've got the smartest minds in Silicon Valley here about to transition into industry. Um, and I want to start by asking, when you got out of your Stanford masters, what was it like coming into an industry that barely existed? It was exciting, of course. <coughs> uh, yes, I started my... Uh, whatever I've done all these years in Silicon Valley in 1972. Back then, there were only three semiconductor companies. And I thought I made a big mistake in the program that I pursued at Stanford. It turned out that it was just perfect setup. For, uh, I was so curious about uh, some of the courses in, at Stanford at that time. There was only electrical engineering, although they mixed in some courses in physics and computer science, data structures, things like that. But those are the old times now. If you, look, if you go to any university now, they split it all up, which is probably better if you want to focus deep into any one of those. But in those days, it was all flat. And that's exciting by itself, because you begin to study a lot of uh, very interesting topics. And when I entered Stanford, uh, 
I started a, a course that, that was named Solid State Device Physics. And I was wondering, what is this? I'd never even heard it from anywhere. But I went ahead and, and enrolled there, and then there was there's another one, uh, interesting course, which is about computing architectures. What is a computing architecture? It was just curiosity on my part. And it was exciting, simply because you go to class, you read a book or a chapter in the prescribed book, and everything was new. And given my background, uh, getting a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering in the Philippines, it was not a, <laughs> a good step to go from there to those courses. So what I did was uh, basically get it, uh, very close with a team with, uh, if you go to graduate school, you form your own team. Uh, I had a lot of friends from India as a result. And uh, I would say one of my best friends, in fact, was you know, a U.S. Um, <clears throat> born. And uh, what I regret now is that we did not get in touch uh, as much to where now we don't see each other. But that team, for me, uh, was a lot of help. And we do our own study sessions uh, in the dorm, uh, all the way till whatever time, 1 a.m., doesn't matter. But that helped me a lot. But the nice thing about uh, the, the team discussion was we learned from each other things that were not uh, in the classroom at all. And so that is a lesson for me from the beginning that uh, there's a lot of help out there. And this actually helped me a lot once I started my career. But in the beginning of uh, my career in semiconductors in Silicon Valley, um, there were only three companies, Intel, National Semiconductors, and I forgot the exact name. I think it is AMI, AMI uh, but They've since disappeared a long, long time ago. And so I had two choices. Uh, but what I used as a metric, therefore, was my background at Stanford, where uh, all of those courses that I took, and then when I interviewed at Intel and National Semiconductors, it, both of them were actually beginning to design CPUs, what we have in our computers today and other devices. And National Semiconductor had this much, much better architecture. So that's the second time I mentioned that. It is a computer, of course, uh, being a CPU, but they, they had a much better architecture. So that was an interesting encounter because I turned down Intel, which became to be a big company. National was big too at that time, but they merged it with uh, Texas Instruments, which is in Texas also a very big company because of their semiconductor products. There's a lot of little things that I learned along the way. Now, I'll give you a little bit of my learning process in the Philippines. Uh, I graduated from MIT, not, not Massachusetts. <laughs> it's Mapua Institute of Technology. At that time, it was actually the best um, engineering school where routinely you know, we take board exams after your degree program, and we just somehow casually top the board exams every time. My class took the top 20. Now, that is not a sign that we are really that good, because once I moved here in the U.S., I was lost. Because there were a lot of uh, courses missing. So I worked hard to, to take those things um, on my own to start reading books and so on, and actually getting involved in the design process in semiconductors. So my background, uh, albeit at the university level in semiconductor device physics, uh, that course or that learning started here at Berkeley actually. Semiconductors were started, was really started by professors from at UC Berkeley. And over the years, I've gotten to know them to the point where we, we are really good friends. Some of the professors are still here. And so I got involved with a lot of the, um, I would say, advising uh, 
with UC Berkeley and the professors and into a way where we uh, make tough decisions about the direction of engineering here at, at Berkeley. And to me, that's just kind of like a reward. But the work most rewarding for me was the fact that at one point, in, uh, after a few years of being a design engineer in the Valley, uh, and I'm sure you guys are thinking about this also, at some point in time, you will become ambitious in extending uh, your career into not only working for a company, but you begin to think about your accumulated knowledge and become brave, actually. You challenge yourself. Now, in the early days of um, semiconductors and computing, there was this little group that was formed. It's called Homebrew Computer Club. And I was one of the 30 members of that club. Two of those you will recognize right away. There was the two Steves, Steve Jobs and Steve, what's his last name? Steve. Yeah. <laughs> That's him. <laughs> and he also was, in fact, we met uh, at the College of Engineering Advisory Board uh, years later as members of that. We started teasing each other basically because of that homebrew computer club. <laughs> and that club, we challenged each other. Again, this, is, this was a lesson in learning more about uh, the things that I need to know that I need for my career. And sometimes what we do is we challenge each other and, uh, in terms of, okay, you present your technical invention here. Let's see if it's good enough. There's a lot of teasing there, but it's all friendly. Can you talk about when you, when at this stage, what existed and didn't exist in the semiconductor landscape in terms of, maybe in terms of tools, for example. Like you're trying to innovate, but at the same time, there's some tooling that just didn't exist. Oh my gosh, you bring me back to pain. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was in the beginning, of course, we have to, what we called at that time, we have to reduce the technical things to practice before us. Semiconductors really started when I got out of Stanford. And so you can imagine that to practice that, because I really liked it, and there's a lot of engineers from different top univers universities from Stanford, Berkeley, of course, uh, having started that. Um, I didn't have a co-worker in the early days uh, from MIT, only in the later part where uh, I was in the team with a very, very smart MIT graduate. And so, the, let's see, how should I put this thing, the compilation of these little accumulated things uh, develop a confidence where uh, to reduce it to practice, we had to design the tools. So I started at the National Semiconductors where uh, I worked with engineers who were really top-notch designers in semiconductors, but they had no idea how to design computer chips. I joined and I saw a bunch of ones and zeros and all the chain of ones and zeros, and I asked the director, what is this? Well, that's how we will design the chip. Oh, really? And it's a CPU chip. So I asked his permission. I need six months to finish all the software so that we can design this chip properly. What software? So this is just an example of how um, semiconductor CPUs and other uh, complex chips started. So they weren't, they, were, they weren't even writing assembly code. <laughs> they were writing ones and zeros. It was awful, so. And, and why did, how did you know about software? Well, computing architectures at Stanford, you cover all of those to where you start with data structures. And then uh, they even, no, I have, eventually I worked with this guy, but he was my professor in um, computer science. And um, he said, just keep in mind to the class that 
programming is really just two components, data structures and algorithms, that's it. Or oh, what about the language? <laughs> so at national, because we have a new CPU, I had to create a simplified language which was very similar to what we used at Stanford in those days. You guys have Soya and you probably haven't heard of the word algol. That was a language at that time. It was very formal and uh, I would say very efficient. So what I did was I used that and I, I wrote a compiler. That's when I realized that writing a compiler is much harder than designing a chip. <laughs> You know, there's just so many combinations of sentences and things like that. But I had to do it because I told my boss I will do this, so it was pressure. In the end, we had that, and then I moved on to write uh, uh, assembly language uh, compilers, or oh, what we call assemblers. From there, my boss asked me, could you please, please just do everything then? <laughs> okay, so I... I designed a small system so that when we have the chip, we can debug it. But before that, I wrote uh, simulators, debuggers, all that stuff. Uh, everything was new. So it's a good thing you uh, asked that question because at the Homebrew Computer Club, so I just poured that in one at a time so that I don't have to <laughs> do some more <laughs> for the Homebrew Computer Club. It was good. Uh, but in different, uh, let's see, there are still quite a few uh, efforts that we have to do in, in my industry. Semiconductors and computing systems where we're still coming up with new architectures and so on. You mentioned briefly, or someone mentioned briefly about AI. Yeah, yeah and just to sort of contextualize why I'm double clicking on, on this, I think that you know a lot of people who are doing computer science we're familiar with assemblers, compilers, debuggers. Although they, they don't at all resemble what Dado had to deal with, they're still you know, fundamentals. Um, but there are higher level frameworks. There's the explosion of JavaScript frameworks that's happening, right? And it's been happening for some time. So a lot of you all who are going out in the industry will be faced with this decision of how, how much to invest in tools and infrastructure and how much to invest in building the thing that you're, you're asked to build. And so I, it, it's interesting to hear how you navigated that balance and, and sometimes had to justify it um, to the company or the enterprise. Yeah. So a little bit of background uh, about uh, my approach to AI. Um, it turns out uh, that there are a whole bunch of things that needed to be learned, at least from my uh, point of view, uh, especially in architectures. Because of the process of, you know, you, you're designing a few networks here and there, and then the process of inference and machine learning is slightly different from different algorithms that we usually uh, write code for any CPU. And the nice thing is that it is actually much faster in coming up with solutions for complex algorithms. The, the neural networks, I'm sure you guys have been through many courses already in AI, but networks is, is nothing but an algorithm. And in fact, the way we say it in industry is that the network will program itself. Don't worry about the details. However, you have to clean up your data properly. But that also can be either manual or automated. So what we did in the, in the approach that I took for AI, uh, let's see, let me step back one. There was a time in my industry in semiconductors about uh, 10 years ago where, because <clears throat> I was already a very active uh, uh, investor in companies, years, even years before that, and I observed that the, the, my industry in semiconductors was shrinking simply because the cost of money to create a lot of these complex chips is anywhere from 100 to 200 million dollars. Fairly complex. Uh, and by the time you get it done, two, two years on the average, some of them uh, are three years. 
And because of that, I observed the migration of investors from semiconductors into software. Software are, are tough to do, but they are far cheaper than um, the cost of coming up with a chip. And a lot of the engineers were migrating also into different companies now, software. So I observed that, that problem because that is my 100% career, and that if it disappears, that would be a shame. So what I did was, uh, in my uh, venture firm, uh, what we have there also, what I did was that I have five minimum of what I call executives in residence. These are, a lot of them are my friends who I know are very and so we use them to help us in dissecting the opportunities of many, many different ideas that potentially we can invest in. Uh, but given that problem that I observed, uh, I gathered my EIRs for about a day and discussed all the issues that we have to deal with if we want to continue uh, our careers and the future generation of semiconductor chip designers. We identified quite a few. And in the end, we concluded that we need to come up with a totally different way of designing and coming with totally different architectures that can solve multiple algorithms and so on. So we started to do that. Uh, we were halfway into the process where we had observed that uh, AI is a very similar challenge in the solutions that we came up with. In other words, we can solve AI at the same time. So what's nice is that we have one engine that we can throw into solving a, an ASIC application specific IC, ASIC, new chip at the speed of compilation of the algorithm and mapping those nodes in the architecture of the chip to specify the function of that node. So we totally solved the problem of $200 million per chip. So we'll just manufacture it, multiple of them, with blank logic, and then we program it, and now we have that. But if you look at how you guys uh, design your neural networks, it's identical. So we've solved that, and to this day, the, that chip is the fastest engine in AI in the world today. I'm sure there will be other engineers that will challenge themselves and, un, you know, <laughs> so probably compete with that, but uh, I'll take time. So that is a lesson to where as we identify new challenges, we still go back and use previous knowledge. Yeah. It helps a lot. So th that's an awesome, like, story, especially because we just had a question um, on how you decide what to work on. And I think that this example sort of shows an approach of looking around, looking, looking horizontally, and you've unified your knowledge of the software side and the hardware side. And that seems to be a common thread. Looking, sitting between these two industries and seeing the path forward. Um, and I, I guess I'd just ask, sort of following on to the question of how you decide what to work on, um, do you feel like you have unusual rigor in your approach of gathering information? Mm, no, it's, it's probably more instinctive than <laughs> investigation. But um, <clears throat> you're right, though, that question is very appropriate because the way I derived the What's the right word? The opportunities, the future opportunities, was more of two things. One, solving a problem that the entire industry is going through. That's my last example, or previous example. Or solving something that is so hard that you just have to be putting every second, every minute, every hour of your day to solve that problem. And typically when you solve that problem, it actually just explodes in the industry. For example, you know that IBM uh, PC chipset. I looked at the design that IBM came up with, and I opened the, it was a 
beige colored box, metal and all that stuff. Can you imagine that was their packaging at that time? But I opened it up just for curiosity. And actually to learn a little bit, I was shocked. There must have been at least 300 to 400 semiconductor chips in it. And I thought, whoa, this is from IBM, this is the best they can do. I was disappointed, frankly. So what I did was I took one of their software manuals and I read it almost every day, every night, until I was able to uh, understand how, what their intention was. In other words, there, there was, I wasn't looking at technology, I was looking really at the functionality, interpreting it from a software point of view. But there's a lot of inside stuff in there because it's, it's a lot of logic and so on. What I did was I opened it up and told Maria, my wife over there, <laughs> uh, I will use our dining table for a few months because <laughs> I will design here. <laughs> and sure enough, uh, I used it and started to theorize as to what architecture it might be. Um, on the, the second reason was not only because I think I know how, can, how I can redesign it, but also a big company like IBM, they are not kidding or they are always serious, but when they put their product out there, expect that it will have a long life. So I concluded, wait a minute, if they did this, I think that this product will go for a long run. So that's when I sat down and started redesigning the whole chip, uh, the whole uh, computer. And I ended up with three chips and so on. So that changed the landscape of the whole industry simply because it is so much faster and so much cheaper. And that, uh, I, I would say, uh, happy to see also that a lot of countries in the world, especially Asia, benefited from that design. So now it's not only the U.S. <laughs> taking advantage of it, and so on. So the challenge there was a very, uh, very different challenge. I, yeah, I thought that I can outdo IBM in a potentially massive market. Today, it's, it's a huge market, obviously. So you're solving it. Throughout your career, you've solved these problems that require you to go broad and deep and you get really into the technical problems. Um, and I'm sure that's caused a lot of difficulty yeah. along the way. What's, what's the, and in, in solving those problems, you solve them in a way that's complete. It's not just a technology. You're not just inventing a technology. You're creating a product, you're building a team, you're building a company, you're creating a viable business that then extends that solution into the world. What's the, what's the payoff for you? How would you, like what, what drives that? Yeah, the payoff is a lot of money, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just practical, you know? Yeah, practical, yeah. Uh, the payoff, of course, is that I, I think we have advanced the state of technology in that business. And to this day, mainframes, min computers, workstations, and now AI engines, the next generation of opportunities in technology are, are brought about by that possibility that you can optimize, you can make it cheaper using your, uh, I would say, suicidal instincts. <laughs> I, always, I always describe myself as suicidal because it is very risky, obviously. But what else can you do as an engineer? You learn engineering to do things that no one has seen before. At least that's how I look at it, to make it interesting. The other side on this, my view of coming up with uh, things is all about the market. Uh, one of the big problems in many parts of the industry is that there's a lot of engineers who are creative, but sometimes they miss the intent of what they are doing, and so there's no market. A lot of companies die simply because of that. So you create yourself a challenge. The challenge is that one example. The challenge, the other challenge for me is that, all right, I will make this cheaper, I will make it faster, 
for a better price and so on. In other words, it's a very in, intentful uh, kind of goal that is already defined by things that are already there, rather than coming up with a totally new uh, product. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so this connects, I think, to another question. Thank you for the questions, by the way. So uh, the question is, education usually happens early. Has the world changed where you need to go to school every few years to remain relevant? And I, I, I think I want to reshape this question into, you know, you're still innovating uh, in AI, which is a wave that was only possible because of some of your previous innovations. What, uh, and right now we're in a world where knowledge is plentiful, right? We, we're, we have a fire hose in our pockets of, of just uh, an amazing amount of information. How do you still learn real things, relevant things, in the abundance of information and the acceleration with which information is changing? Yeah. Not surprising, uh, layers of previous knowledge are very useful in that regard. The, the different layers may not be by themselves directly addressing what you may be thinking, but if you put them all together, uh, magical things happen actually. And that's how I always view these new technologies coming up, like AI. I sat down and started reading the stuff and so on, and then I thought, aha, I think I can design a much better engine. So that knowledge that the, the community of artificial intelligence experts years back from MIT and other universities, uh, if you study that, you can learn more things. And then you say, oh, I can do this much better and faster and cheaper. So it happens because of the, the interest in designing things, the interest in coming up with new ways of solving a problem, utilizing new technologies or combination of technologies that can do it better than what was done before that. And uh, the nice thing, and my, my, even my closest friends tell me, you are crazy. You are, in, you are a VC now, a venture capitalist, putting money in new opportunities. And you're still coming up with these ideas? Yeah. And that's why we had, I always had five EIRs in my VC firm, because we discuss the possibilities almost every day. And we challenge each other. So speaking of that and the new possibilities, when you, when you came out from Stanford, um, you know, the semiconductor industry was so nascent, the tools didn't even exist. Um, besides AI, which of course you're innovating in, what are some other fields um, that strike you as potentially similar in, in that they're, they're open, they need to be shaped and innovated in? Whoa, okay, maybe I should disclose this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a lot of you are probably in computer science, AI, all kinds of related um, fields, right? Yes, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, show of hands, how many are in computer science? And uh, biology? Data science. Data science? Data science, okay. That's enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you will understand this. If you observe the growth of uh, computer science and other uh, Electric I mean, electrical engineering type of subsets and so on. First of all, there is a lot of code out there, software, very complex and so on. Somehow I am, right now, um, I'm so focused on this. The fact that there is so much variety of code and applications out there. So think about this and maybe I'm prompted to tell you this so that maybe I can solve the problem with you. <laughs> and that is, imagine that you have a tool, maybe another software tool, that can decode the algorithm of those programs. 
Okay, if you can do that, we can map that algorithm onto an AI engine and execute that algorithm so much faster than software. Can you imagine the lines of codes out there that you can access and then converting that to an algorithm which becomes an AI application? That's massive. It could be much, much richer than those successful entrepreneurs before us, like the guys at Microsoft, Facebook, and so on. There's just so many algorithms out there that we can pull out. But it is hard to read code unless you have another, a, 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 I would say, decompiler, if there's such a word. I think that's a huge opportunity. Somehow I've been thinking of this for the last few weeks. So sort of like a master, a master algorithm yeah. that deconstructs, finds right. the, uh, yep. the and, eigenvalues of a And even algorithm. that, now you can go back and forth between uh, software and the AI engine. And if you can do that, I would say you can solve practically any tough problem that you can encounter. By then, we are all automated. <laughs> but that's good, you know, we can all go to Hawaii or wherever. <laughs> Maybe the Philippines. <laughs> so that's, you know, it, it's, I'm sure you guys go through this, through this phase in your life, or some portion of your thinking every day, every week, whatever. But that's what I do. Somehow, I, I latch on to something until I decide that no, this is useless, or there is more. And this is connected to your other question as to how do I come up with products? Yeah, so I want to approach that from a different angle. Again, uh, there's a question, and the way I want to shape this is, um, you know, you, yes, you build products, but also teams and companies from the inside, and then also as a, as a VC. Yeah. Um, what, what advice would you give people as they're trying, starting to form collaborations? and look for collaborators. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll pick one um, item on my five list of success factors. I'm not going to go through the five. I'll just pick up one. <laughs> it, and one is that uh, when I begin the process of beginning to um, hire engineers or management or whatever, in whatever that may be that I want to build. My standards in picking the, the hires, especially engineers, is that they have to be the best in the world. I have to form the best team in the world. Now, this sounds like forever, but it's not because industries can be reduced to a manageable entity because you, you would tend to pick, at least what I do is I tend to pick the best companies right away and begin to identify the best players in those companies and then go ahead. I'll give you one example. Uh, when we started to think about the 60 gigahertz Wi-Fi, which is now uh, named Wi-Fi AD, and I know you guys, we all use Wi-Fi at different speeds. But at that kind of frequency, at, it's uh, six, at least 60 gigahertz. And you know, whenever you have uh, high frequency, that means that if you can uh, decode whatever data it, it processes, uh, that's very, very high speed uh, rate, data rate of uh, dealing with data. So that came up as an opportunity. It was finally, after years of definition by IEEE, this is the Institute in Electronics and Electrical Engineering, uh, it took time, but it was approved. So now, that's another way for me to look at opportunities, because those standards tend to be used by all of us. It starts with large companies. So I, there were two, um, companies that were started here in Silicon Valley dealing with that. 
I talked to them and so on, so I kept that in my um, database. And then there was another one in uh, <clears throat> Israel, and then another one in um, Australia. Um, Maria and myself and some friends were vacationing in New Zealand uh, one time, and we were on our way back. But my assistant uh, called and said, hey, you need to stop by um, Australia. What's the cap name of the capital? Sydney. Yeah. <laughs> Sydney. Yeah. Um, I was called by the Research Institute to look at what they have done in Wi-Fi AD to present to me uh, the possibility that I can, uh, that I would like it and then invest in it because they were raising money. So I stopped by there and evaluated it. But before that, a month before that, I looked at, uh, I went to Israel and looked at that team that uh, was working on Wi-Fi AD. I picked them already a month before we stopped by Australia. But I'm just using this uh, a, a fairly recent example of when you pick your engineers, they better be the best in the world because you will have a lot of competition. And so that's one major criteria for the five success factors that I usually use when I fund or start a company. That's fairly strict. Uh, way of, um, I would say, priorities in hopefully being successful in whatever that may be. And um, again, looking at collaboration through a different lens, yeah. maybe back when you were the young guy in the industry, did, were there uh, mentors or people that you learned from? And how did you um, find those people in terms of people who had the knowledge that you wanted and also people who you could work with? Yeah. There are two classes of that. I always refer to professors here <laughs> and at Stanford. And sometimes we bring them to our offices. And what I do is I line up my engineers, OK, Professor Hodges will be there for the whole day. You guys line yourselves up, get your questions. So they do it one at a time. That's why we're very, very close to Berkeley because of that help that I got from them. And so we, Maria and I uh, funded an institute here simply because of that kind of help that we got. Um, a long time ago, uh, we wanted to also put an institute at Stanford, but uh, somehow something got, it was a hassle anyway. But Stanford also provided us uh, professors. And some of those I'm close to also when, because they are still there when, um, they were there when I was there. And so there's familiarity, but we work with the dean because my venture fund, we funded uh, the uh, electrical engineering for whatever they want to do through the dean. Dean Plummer was the previous dean there. Uh, and he's also uh, in semiconductors, so we're fairly close. But, so those are the, my first goal. And then of course, a lot of my friends that I grew up with in the industry, Either I hire them or uh, we just go to lunch and something and then solve something. Um, it turns out that there's a lot of resources everywhere if you just make sure that you, um, you properly define uh, what you want. Uh, and sometimes past engineers in my uh, companies, you will, you will find out that they would like to help actually. So, there's a lot of good resources. I want to switch gears a bit because there's a, there's a question, what was the most difficult point in your journey to the career you have now? And maybe there's an opportunity for... It's, it's okay, it. ask that again. It's what? Ask it again. Uh, what was the most... You're solving hard problems, right? Yeah. What, is the mo what was the most difficult point 
whether in business or in problem solving in your career so far? Okay. Let me take the technical one because that's easier to answer. <laughs> when I started Surf, the GPS company, that was hard. We used all kinds of transforms, Fourier, Legrand, all that and, stuff. And what was the filtering? Those what was things. the problem? Huh? What was the what was the problem that you were trying to solve? Well, GPS, the, the satellite is way up there. Yeah. And there's jitter, and I've worked out location data, so it's, you know, it's terrible. There's, cloud, there's more stewards through the cloud, all that little stuff. I mean, you have to combine all kinds of weird filters or algorithms uh, and so on, and then come up with the right engine to process it so that it can process it in time. Uh, that was hard. I went to He was, yes, airport, Air Force. I found one engineer who did a lot of the first GPS for the military. So again, this is an example of you have to pick the right guy. <laughs> I found him and then um, I told him, okay, I would like to start a company with you, but let's get also the right marketing guy. I found those two. And then in the beginning, we... Uh, we worked together at my house, <laughs> and they used our guest house. One day, Marie asked me, hey, when are those guys leaving our guest room? That's when I said, oh, okay, okay, we'll get an office. <laughs> but it was intense in the very beginning, and we thought, actually, that it was hard to do. You know, a lot of the GPS systems before that were huge systems. So on. But we were able to reduce it in one chip, and so that's why we have GPS in all our phones, basically. Um, there are others who are making GPS chips now too, but that was that was a good one because no one has dared to do it before us. And did what probability did you think you had of succeeding? In the beginning, uh, probably less than fifty percent. <laughs> we almost gave up. That's a, that's a very interesting point that I want to drill into. We, we talked about um, rigor and solving hard problems that matter. And if, if the problem matters and there's, there's, there's a reward, you know, there's the motivation to continue. Um, can you talk about a time that you decided the rational thing was to give up? Uh, when we run out of money. <laughs> <laughs> very practical. <laughs> Okay, I don't think you guys know this, but my very first, first startup, we just literally ran out of money. But I did not stop. I redesigned it and did that, and then that's when uh, fortune happened. Uh, a friend of mine, who was a close friend of a real estate, magnate in Silicon Valley. A lot of his buildings are still there. And so we, we had lunch and, hey, I have an idea. Said, yeah? I, he, and then he said, I've been looking for an idea. Oh, okay, we can do this. But that investor, that mag, the real estate guy, gave us the first million. And that's when I went back and cleaned up the previous design. And lo and behold, uh, we used that one million and another, I would say, $200,000. We finished designing and started uh, the company in formality. In other words, we, don't, we then brought the other, like sales and, and so on. But to this day, that company uh, was is still hold, still holds the record from time zero to IPO in Silicon Valley. We I, what we IPO'd it in uh, 24 months, and that that is is still the company that that was the most profitable 
uh, and so on, Etoset in Spain, as we grew the company and so on. We, our revenue, four years later, was uh, about 800 million and so on. So that's... Not bad. <laughs> so a lesson there is that don't give up. Just go and get more resources and then go at it again. The company failing is not the same as giving up. Huh? In, in other words, the company shutting down is not the same as giving up. No, 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 no. That, that was, the name of the company was Chips and Technologies. Um, I want to talk about another hard problem and, and shift gears to, to talk a bit about PhilDev. So, you know, you always approach problems as a designer and an engineer, whether it's a business problem or uh, a technical problem. Yeah. Um, there was a question in the audience about um, call centers in the Philippines and how it seems like the Philippines has put a lot of its eggs into one basket, which is call centers. And how do you break out of that and, and really deliver innovation? So I was wondering if you could talk about your approach to that um, via PhilDev. <clears throat> so maybe the question is, how do you create, yeah, how do you create a new wave, like a step function change in innovation yeah. in the Philippines? <clears throat> Maria and I uh, founded a uh, foundation Ten years ago. Ten years, right? Yeah, ten years ago. I'm so old. <laughs> and uh, used that as a means of channeling our desire to, to help the Philippines. The name of the foundation is called PhilDev, P-H-I-L-D-E-V. -E the intention there was to hopefully build a country, and I'm talking about the Philippines, that can compete against uh, other countries, at least uh, in Asia. As you know, we have, we don't have much uh, of a business in uh, products that have a lot of value. We have agriculture, we have other things, but uh, there is no significant uh, achievement in these kinds of things that we are talking about. And so we took the long approach of we need to train a lot of engineers, a lot of scientists. From there, we need to teach them how to innovate, how to create products, and then the last goal is that whatever we do will have to be able to compete so that we can bring in money into the country. Right now we are negative in the Philippines. We buy a lot of products, including simple <laughs> laptops. And that's what I, I always tell even my best friends and the government, like, if you guys cannot do a simple laptop, something is wrong. So with PhilDev, uh, we combine that with a push for um, convincing the government to begin to get serious about education and then from there all the other stuff. So the first program that uh, <clears throat> uh, I came up with was funded of $25 million every year for scholarship for all Filipinos who want to take advantage of it. And it was shocking that within 30 minutes, she just said, okay. So that's the first thing about education. And that's why we picked engineering degrees and so on, related uh, technology um, education. That program is still ongoing today. And that was when, uh, how long ago was that now? Maybe nine years, 10 years, yeah. A few years later, one after that started, uh, we observed that, um, and when I say we, me, and um, the Philippines, the government and universities um, observed that we are beginning to um, see PhDs coming back from that scholarship program. So I went back to the government 
and suggested um, to fund two institutes, one in ICT, the other in um, health sciences and translational medicine. And again, we justified it. Uh, this one went through a little bit of turbulence for a while, and somehow the senators thought that they don't need it. <laughs> Especially, and this is surprising, uh, someone from the Department of Science and Technology it was kind of weird. But we didn't give up. So we went around the authorities and approved it. And it got approved. That's $205 million for five years. So we are still spending some of that. So now we are beginning to have partners. For example, that program is partnered with the UC system, Berkeley, UC Davis, uh, UC Santa Cruz, Merced, UCLA. I think that's it for now. So the programs, the, the research uh, topics are created from the Philippines. And where it applies to any of the UC universities, we get help from them. So uh, in, in most cases, we send our engineers here uh, to get their PhDs, the professors, of course. And then the UC system reciprocate where they give lectures when they are there in, in the Philippines. So that's ongoing. The third one is new, only about a year, but I suggested that we need to begin to create products. So we came up with the idea of an inclusive innovation center, where now we take advantage of those research products, uh, the results, and begin to design technology-based products. Understanding that one way that we can reduce the negative flow of the government money or the people's money in the Philippines is to compete against those countries where we buy a lot of this from. And, and most likely, when we get there, we will probably uh, and most likely create the tools for education itself. The first thing, one of the first things we did is that we designed a client server system for every elementary school and high school in the Philippines. And it is being distributed now and bought by the different towns and cities to where our um, elementary school uh, students and high school students can now properly use computing as a tool. And the Department of Education is, has a large database where the teachers can now download those relevant um, topics to teach the, the children. And the very first installation was in Tagui, near Manila. And uh, we, then, we were there, of course, we celebrated it. Uh, and uh, while we were there, we saw a teacher that was crying. It's interesting because we knew that they didn't think that that could happen. But we were wrong. So we asked the teacher, what's happening here? Sir, for the first time, I will be able to teach the children. It's so dramatic that um, I think it was Brother Armin that had tears. Brother Armin was our sponsor for this program when he was with the Department of Education? Yeah, <laughs> okay. And those are the things that we will build. We even, uh, we, we, we change a lot of the design where we use even DC current so that we save energy, not AC. We even use ethernet where we derive power from ethernet cables things like that. We had to design um, power management for the, for the classrooms because the electrical system in the Philippines is very rough. So anyway, these are the things that um, we do. So some of those results will go to um, the Inclusive Innovation Center. We will keep on designing more and more. In that program, by the way, we use as many Filipino engineers as we could hire. 
So it's difficult. But I'm getting the, uh, the time signal to wrap up, but I think that that, thank you for sharing what you're doing with PhilDev, because I think it ties together the approach, the rigor, the way that you innovate with connectedness, and the recognition throughout your career that sustained change happens through a combination of technology and product market fit. It's not just one or the other. Yeah, quick, right. two yeah. quick things. One is that we have been teaching uh, innovation and entrepreneurship in the Philippines in the last three years based on my five success factors written in about 500 pages, but it's not published. <laughs> I give it to my CEOs when I fund a new company, telling the CEO, here's a book that you should read, but if you have your own, that's fine. But if you didn't read this and you fail, something is wrong. <laughs> but anyway, we, we try to teach that, fill them also. That's our arm working with different universities in the Philippines uh, and so on. And the other thing, of course, is that you're a scholar. I see quite a few of our scholars in this. So we go direct to uh, helping uh, Filipino Americans. And of course, the Philippines. We have, we have a lot more scholars in the Philippines, I think. Right? Okay. <laughs> so, Maria is in charge of scholarship. <laughs> <laughs>